let everyone get a chance to, to connect to audio. Thank you for joining us for Lunch and Learn. I, I will be introducing today's guest, Cleveland Robinson. Cleveland Robinson is a Fisk graduate, a member of Omega Sci-Fi, and the founder of Robin House Behavior Services, located here in Dallas. Mr. Robinson is a licensed therapist and an advocate of mental wellness within African-American communities. Robin's House provides individual counseling, group counseling, and case management services to adults and youth who have experienced barriers to mental health services. So I, I will have to go to Mr. Robinson. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm still muted. <laughs> Got it. Thank there you, you go. so sure. much um, for the introduction. Um, most importantly, um, uh, thank you to Dallas Public Library for this recorded event um, and the things we were able to do to get to this point. Um, and of course, um, um, to um, the staff there. Um, Miss uh, uh, Alicia um, for allowing this event to happen. So thank you so much, um, Alicia, for um, thinking enough um, of me to deliver this e extremely um, important message that we're working on for mental health. So for those who will be joining, um, if you've already joined, um, definitely please share this link as we're going to have um, a very, very um, transparent conversation today. Also, thank you to Mr. Isaac. Um, I cannot um, say thank you so much for thinking of me, of course, to even bring me to um, Dallas Public Library um, to be the, the speaker on mental health and self-care um, amongst African Americans. So today will be um, a conversation we're going to have, a transparent conversation about uh, mental health, and I've spoken on this topic um, for years, um, but my approach is different now. Um, as life goes on, as many of you all know, um, life happens, and when life happens, uh, if you're left standing, you should always gain some wisdom through what you experience in life that you can apply to your day-to-day -day living moving forward, ultimately making the quality of your life improve. So I'm going to be uh, sharing um, a lot of my story today with you, um, as well as providing you um, with a foundational understanding of uh, mental health, how it's affecting you in ways that you don't even know. I want to give you some numbers so you'll understand that you're, you're not alone um, in your, your journey, um, shall we say. Um, and I also want to definitely assist you in understanding how you can better improve your life and focus on your uh, mental health. And I'm going to be using the word mental health and mental wellness interchangeably um, today uh, because we are trying to get away as a, a, a community of professionals from the stigma that's attached to the word mental health or mental illness. And so now the focus is going to wellness. So I'll be using that term a lot uh, today as well. Also, some things to keep in mind is that I will also be focusing a lot on the self-care aspect of things. Um, it goes without saying we understand if something may be wrong or something is not normal or off about us. But how about the self-care? So I'll be focusing on the silver line and the more positive things about mental wellness today as we go on this uh, brief journey um, towards becoming a better us and becoming a better you. So I have uh, been working in the field um, since 2014, specifically. I started in Atlanta and it was an eye opener to me. I started in the community uh, mental health world and it was tough, you know, in the community health world, you go to where people are at. And so I have uh, done 
counseling and uh, therapy everywhere. And when I say everywhere, I mean everywhere. Uh, uh, in a car, um, I've done therapy under a bridge. Um, we had to reach out to a lot of homeless people. So you meet people where they are. Um, wherever you can think of, you know, uh, at a Burger King, in a Starbucks, we met people where they are. But it was an eye-opener to me because not only was I maybe doing therapy in a car or in a Starbucks, I was also going to some mansions, you know, and, and some affluent areas um, in Atlanta. And what that helped me understand as an up-and-coming therapist is that mental health does not discriminate. Um, and we'll get to um, why some populations struggle a little more than others uh, very shortly. Um, but it doesn't discriminate, you know, it doesn't matter how much money you have, um, doesn't matter where you're from, um, but it can matter on, uh, uh, who you are from. And we'll get to that as well when we're dealing with some predispositions for mental health. We'll deal with that in a second. Um, but first and foremost, let's talk about, um, the fact that you're not alone. I always start. Um, speaking about mental health from the you are, not, you are not alone standpoint by providing you with some numbers. And this month, we're definitely dealing with black health and black mental health. So I want you to hear these numbers um, as I go through them here and really reflect on what they may mean to you. Also, as we're going through today, feel free to put questions in the chat box. You do not have to wait to the end. I always like being extremely um, interactive, and so you don't have to wait to the end to ask questions. I'll look to answer them. So here are some numbers, okay? Uh, black and African-American people living below the poverty line are twice as likely to report serious psychological distress than those living over two times the poverty line. Um, adults, um, adults, African-American adults, are more likely to feel feelings of sadness, um, hopelessness, and worthlessness than adult whites. African Americans are likely more likely than 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 uh, are less likely than white people to die from suicide at all ages. However, Black and African American teenagers are more likely to attempt suicide than white teenagers. I'm going to read that again. That's extremely profound. Although African Americans do not attempt suicide as much as white Americans, African American teens are more likely to attempt suicide than white teenagers. And we're going to come back to that um, in a minute because that's always been an extremely uh, um, alarming statistic. Um, African Americans have uh, are reported uh, to having mental illness at 22.4% uh, of the population. That's almost 1.1 million people. Um, from 2008 to 2018, serious mental illness rose amongst African Americans. Some of the major uh, illnesses and mental illnesses that African Americans are going to deal with are major depressive disorder, uh, anxiety disorder, and, and schizophrenia of being some of the major ones. 16%. Um, of African American people reported having a mental uh, illness, um, despite being less than the overall U.S. population, episodes of depression increased from nine percent to ten point three percent. So I want to stop there for a moment. And um, the numbers, although they are alarming, honestly, in the big picture of things, they make sense. Now, if I was in front of a live audience, I would ask. Why do you think these numbers um, are so alarming and so why? Well, truth of the matter is, as we have discovered, especially during the pandemic, there are now undeniable things that African-Americans deal with that other folk don't. Um, and I understand we're in a environment where, you know, uh, um, where we can no longer deny what truth is um, gener from generational feeling, generational oppression, um, from underemployment, 
um, from dealing with poverty. The masses of poverty um, are African American because in many of our major cities, we're talking about Detroit, New York, um, Atlanta, Dallas, Houston, um, and many of our big, large urban epic centers, inner city poverty is focused on African American populations and people of color. And so we already understand the numbers that there are things that come with being impoverished. We're talking about when you're impoverished, you're thinking about food insecurity. Um, you're thinking about um, um, uh, discrepancies in education. You're talking about all types of things, more drugs, more crime, um, that happen statistically in a lot of these major urban, urban centers, where, where these statistics really come from, that affect, uh, in particularly, our African-American youth. As a matter of fact, the ages that they didn't report any statistics, but in other findings that they have, is that you have higher rates of suicidality in college age black men from the ages of 18 to 24. So what that says, um, and it's sad to say that our youth, 18 to 24 year, year old youth, um, and you can think about what are the 18 to 24 year old black men that you know? Um, is it your son? You know, is it uh, a young man you know from, 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 um, from church, um, your, your nephew, um, whomever it may be, uh, silently, this population is suffering. Um, and they're really struggling um, with dealing with day-to-day -day things. A large portion of this is social media that also leads into a lot of internalization um, of depression and anxiety. Um, and for those who don't know, we'll get into a little bit more. When we get to the places of considering um, suicide, that's because an individual gets to the point clinically where they feel like they're dealing with hopelessness. And so what that says, and we're really, really, really um, deciphering these statistics is there's a large majority of young black men from the ages of 18 to 24 who are getting to a point in their lives more than any other population that they are feeling hopeless. So this is something to really think about. And it lets you know that it's undeniable. Um, that there are forces going on and outside of um, our direct sphere that is really playing into the psyche of this entire population, the next generation of people that we are dealing with. Let's go on with some numbers. So attitudes towards mental health. Let's park here um, for a minute and I'll share some things um, with you. As I said, I would share some of my story. So, um, I uh, have always been in, involved in advocacy for years, and um, it started with just community work, faith-based work, a lot of faith-based work, as um, I've always been involved in uh, ministry, in Christian-based ministry, and so I began my passion for people long, long, long ago um, when I was um, a teenager. And in college, um, I was still involved in a lot of advocacy, joined some organizations, as we said, um, in the, um, the introduction. And I mean, life was good. One of my focuses in my practice is helping individuals deal with transition and adjustment. After my co collegiate years, I had realized as many college uh, uh, students and new graduates do that life isn't as peachy as being on the yard. And so I stumbled around, you know, a lot from the age of 21 to about 25. It was just stumbling. Um, entry level jobs. It was OK. I was, you know, still young and having a great time. And um, I finally got one of my biggest jobs, um, which wasn't which was people oriented. Uh, but it was a more of a technical job working for um, uh, a municipality or a city down in South Florida. I'm a proud Floridian. As all my friends know, I find every opportunity I can to say something about Florida culture, which I love so much. Um, and so uh, I got my first real job when I was in Florida and I was doing government work. Things were going great. 
Um, I was making what I thought to be good money at the time. You know, I was just having a great, great time growing and thriving and learning my career, um, specifically as a community development professional. And so uh, that was in 2006. Uh, I remember it like it was yesterday, December uh, uh, 15th, um, 2009, uh, 2008 rolls around. And um, my boss calls me into the office and I got unexpectedly laid off. Of course, I was so optimistic during that age and I had uh, uh, saved up some money. And so and I had thought I made good connections. And lo and behold, um, after leaving that job on December 31st of 2008, it took me uh, two and a half, almost three years to get another job. I think that time from 2009 until uh, uh, 2012, um, it was a huge eye opener for me. Because what happened was I had always taken great pride in my ability to network, in my ability to be um, 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 an attractive person in the workplace based off my work ethic um, and what I perceived to be my smarts at the time. Um, three years, almost three years without a job um, and 300 applications. I, rem I, I never forget the number. Um, three different, uh, I had four interviews and, um, uh, didn't get any of them, any of them, um, came in qualified, was told I was overqualified to my face and I never got the jobs. Um, and so I had got down to a point where I was out of money, you know, I was out of money and I was, uh, I didn't even have enough money. My car broke down. I remember it very well. Um. I was still paying on the car, and um, but it broke down, couldn't fix it, so I uh, sent the car to the junkyard, and I still had to pay off that car, a car I didn't own, um, no job, no money, staying on my mother's couch, um, and not enough money to pay a phone bill, anything, so I remember using, a, I forgot what it was, it was, I was this was before Skype. But it was like a, a, a Google computer phone. So when I wanted to meet people, I'd borrow my mom's car and I would um, um, call people on the computer phone and say, hey, I'm going to meet you and be there at so-and-so time. And I would just be on a wing and a prayer that when I got there, they would be there. Um, I just didn't have the money. and so. Um, I had found a, a, a job at a youth facility. I stayed there for a few months and I was like, this is not it. Cause it wasn't even my field. I just needed to work. Um, and eventually, um, I got a couple paychecks under my pocket. I had bought me a couple of those, uh, minute phones from the gas station. Um, that kind of helped me get back and forth. Um, I was able to, um, borrow my mom's car to drive back and forth um, to work. And I was like, this isn't it. So out of the blue, I joined the military. Um, and I, I went as a guard reserveman, but I found the longest training school I could find to just get away. And it was eight months. And the eight months changed my life um, because it allowed me to kind of refocus, recenter, in a healthy environment, um, and thank goodness to Uncle Sam, I wasn't struggling anymore. Um, and so that kind of leads to the understanding that things happen in life, you know, and we have to have certain ways that we continue to move our feet forward. I don't care, we have to crawl. Um, if you can walk, that's cool. If you got to crawl, how have you got to get there? Um, people are making adjustments every single day. And a lot of times I had a mom to call, um, to fall back on, but you know, a lot of people don't have anyone. And I think that's how we get into these places of feeling hopeless, feeling like we don't have any options. We're just struggling to get back on our feet. And so that led me to, uh, the military 
and going into the next chapter before I went to actually uh, school to become a therapist. So we'll take a pause there. We got some questions um, that I want to answer. As I said, uh, we would keep things going with these answers. And so from uh, Antoinette, she says, how do we change the stigma in the black community that's attached to mental health, specifically when it comes to seeing a psychologist or a psychiatrist to address mental health issues? That's a great question. That's th that's that's the question that most people ask. It is very simple, actually. Most communities of color are um, more secretive when it comes to sharing what we believe is family and personal business with the outside world. This is why m most communities of color have a safe space. For black people, um, it's church, which is why for years, instead of going to a therapist, we for the most part uh, would go to our clergy, our pastor or the deacons or the ministerial staff to actually handle things that they were never equipped to handle. Um, as I have always shared during this walk, because I come from a ministry in a Christian background, that we uh, need prayer and professionals. You need both, not just one or the other, if that's what you incline uh, to have um, and you're on a faith-based walk. And so in communities of color, uh, we keep either things in our family or we keep them within a faith circle. So when you go to the priest or to the pastor, that's who you go to consult for your mental health issues. So we have to, as a community of African-Americans um, and people of color, um, break this family, um, this family bond that we can't share anything with the outside world. Um, that's the only way as a community overall that we're going to feel comfortable with beginning to go to a therapist, a psychologist, or a psychiatrist. But watch this. In many of our families, it's not that we don't know anyone with, with mental health issues. Many of us have had an uncle or a cousin or somebody who's had mental health issues and very visible mental health issues. And from my recollection, it's always uh, uh, shrugged off. Like, that's just your cousin. They got issues, you know, or, yeah, they go to the, um, to the doctor. People know, but we don't really talk about it. And as long as it's directly to the doctor and back home, it's cool. But that's, that's, that's the extent of where we have to go. So as a community and as a community of black professionals in the mental health space, we have to talk a little bit more. Um, I want to come to John real quick um, for one of his comments. Um, and he says, um, kind of echoing what we said, uh, blacks do not have the support systems that we used to have in the 50s, 60s, and 70s for my black community. Why once the why once we answer that question, um, I, and I think I understand what you're saying. We as a community can start healing. Um, that's very true, uh, John. I think that the problem um, there is is that we are a more spread out society now, and um, the digital age has not made it any better. Uh, if people pause for a moment, you have family and friends that you may not have even talked to in years, but it feels like you're connected because you're Facebook friends, you all inbox each other, leave comments, like each other's things, but really, you're more apart than you ever have been in your life. Um, and so in those eras, 50s, 60s, 70s, I'll take it further, 80s, 90s, watch this, early 2000s, we were even more connected. In the early 2000s, sometimes I had a phone, okay? And that had nothing to do with income. It's because I could go to a pay phone um, and put a quarter in. And tell someone, I used to road trip everywhere, um, and tell someone, hey, I'm going to be there. I'll take you back even further. I used to hop on the computer, put in my MapQuest mm -hmm. directions, right? Print off my MapQuest directions, put them in my truck. I had a, uh, a Chevy Blazer in. I would go to the payphone, yo, I'm on my way. Mm -hmm. And if I got turned around, of course, I would stop at another payphone. Like, I had to pick up the phone and call and talk to people. So, you know, John, there are a lot of things that are in place with our technology age that is giving the illusion that we're connected, but we are 150 million percent less connected than we ever have been. Um, 
let's transition. I want to um, um, spend a little time, um, as I shared before, talking about um, some of the main diagnosis that we deal with as a community. And as I'm sharing these things, um, I want to then, of course, let you know how to kind of mm. identify them. So you can kind of start thinking on it. Um, so some of the top diagnoses that we deal with are going to be depression. They're going to be um, um, anxiety. And of course, we have a few more severe diagnoses such as uh, schizo uh, schizophrenia, um, or schizoaffective disorder. And that's kind of what people deal with. Um, um, those are um, a little more severe disorders, but these are overall some of the major disorders that we kind of deal with in the African-American community. Um, and as I shared before, there are reasons behind why we deal with those things. We internalize stress a little bit more and we are um, less willing mm. to seek out help. And so um, that goes on the barriers. So some of the barriers that African-Americans face is um, a lot of us, um, as Antoinette shared, are not as willing to go to a professional, would rather go to a faith-based community that isn't necessarily always prepared. Uh, but definitely shout out to the faith-based communities that are now incorporating counseling um, and referrals into their ministries. Um, also, um, lack of uh, black clinicians. Um, for psychiatrists, psychiatrists make uh, black psychiatrists make up. Uh, there's only one to two percent of African American and black psychologists out of all psychiatrists. Excuse me. Um, we have a very low number of um, clinicians. I'm not sure the exact number who are black. The number is even smaller when it comes to black male clinicians, um, as well as that is echoed in black psychologists. Um, of course, you can see a little bit more when you are in more black cities but for the most part um if you have tried to make an appointment with a psychiatrist or psychologist you will then realize uh if you're looking for a black one especially a black male how long your wait mm. will be it could be months and that is uh just how it is we're very unrepresented in the field mm. so that is a second reason um, the third reason is insurance, mm. lack of available and good insurance. Um, in some of our major epic centers, a lot of us have to go to uh, community clinics. Um, if many of us may be on Medicaid or some other type of managed care, not all of the top tier providers accept that type of insurance. And so... Um, you know, you go into a situation where you find uh, uh, providers who are overwhelmed and overworked. Um, and so that is the care that people uh, receive. It's an inadequacy of health care. Um, and so those are some of the major barriers that African-Americans face in their community. Um, um, so I think it's going, it, those are huge barriers, number one, you know. The insurance world isn't turned around tomorrow. People got to take time to go through school. It's going to take generations to kind of change our mentality about trusting the formal mental health care system. But I believe like uh, an old slogan ago, uh, an old, old slogan used to say, um, um, each one reach one. And so, you know, like it's going to take a grassroots level, you know, for us to begin to, to recognize if people are dealing with something and we're taking them by the hand and saying, yo, um, I don't know anybody off the top of my head, but I'm going to help you look. And I think as that goes on, um, it helps. And I think it's also extremely helpful that we are seeing many influencers and celebrities talk about black mental health, you know, for whatever it's worth, at least the message is getting out there. And so we want to consistently um, uh, deal with, with that um so i want to dive back in into what kind of got me here so military goes well and um i get into grad school i uh do really well in grad school and i am of course this this finds 
uh, butts up to the time when I was doing community therapy, finishing my internship hours, and um, I'm here. You know, I'm here now. Um, over the course of the two years, though, I got here in 2018 to Dallas, and I began to build my business, and I was working hard, um, way more hard than I should have. Um, and I had began to notice little small things. Now, I realized that I was dealing with depression pretty bad back in 2009, but that was a lot, of, a lot of times that was directly related to losing my job, being disappointed I couldn't find another job, my pride and my ego being, bu uh, 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 being bruised. Um, but after the military, after training in Atlanta, I got here in 2018. And um, built my business. Things were going well. And I had noticed there were times when I would be up and down. You know, up and down. And um, I thought about it, but I felt like it's, it's, things are off. I got to still get adjusted. And as long as I can keep on getting around people, um, I'll be okay. And so time went on. And... Um, I had realized that nothing was changing. I would go through these up and downs, up and downs. Well, 2020 gets here. Um, and by March, the country was in lockdown. So what's extremely important about this time period is that for the last two years, people have dealt with things that they have never seen before in their lives. I being one of them. Um, and as I shared with you at the beginning, I do my, my, my talking on mental health extremely different now. I think it's extremely crucial to be super transparent and just share your story. And that's what I do. Um, um, way more than it would take an hour to do. But what I will say is um, over those two years, um, um, I got married um, and things didn't go well. And of course, during that time, we're locked down and now I have a child on the way. And so that adds to um, even more stress. Things got darker for me. And for the first time, I had considered medication. Never considered it before. I had been to therapy um, because I think it's important for the therapist to go to therapy. Um, but I had then definitely decided you know what, I need to um, go speak to someone and just see why am I crashing so hard. I realize things are tough at home, um, but this isn't, this is different. And so I, uh, uh, I made an appointment um, and really did a full evaluation and really explained from 2009 to now to make sure that it wasn't only the pandemic that had brought about this. And if it did, that would be fine. But I wanted to paint a whole picture. So I did an official mental health assessment with a psychiatrist um, um, because I wanted to see if medication would help. I was at a point where I realized I needed that. And um, it was it was uh, a phenomenal um, uh, assessment. And he came back to me. He was like, you know, these ups and downs um, make a lot of sense, um, especially what you've experienced and what you've experienced before. So that's when he gave my, my diagnosis of having bipolar 2. And you know what's be beautiful about it is that um, once you can put a name to things, it allows you to move differently with it. You know, um, I feel free, you know, once I understood what was going on. And I'm using this example to, to let you all know that it's very dangerous to try to deal and diagnose yourself. You don't know. Um, you think, think you know. But sometimes things can be less or more severe. But once you can put a name to it, you can deal. The problem a lot of people have is you're trying to deal with your symptoms yourself by talking to friends, which is cool, but they're not professionals. And if you have a friend who's a professional, then they really aren't necessarily equipped to treat you because there's internal bias there. So, you know, like I love giving my friends advice, but I realize I can't be a therapist ever. 
And so I kind of try to put, you know, a barrier there. Um, um, and I fight it, you know, because I want to help my friends. Um, but I'm internally biased. And so, but people are out here dealing. You're dealing with your anxiety. You're dealing with your depression. Um, um, you're dealing with all these other symptoms. <clears throat> you may think you're just having a bad day. Um, you may think something's going on, whatever it may be. But you can't put a name to it. So you don't know if you can deal with your stuff effectively. Um, and that's the problem with not going to a professional when you're dealing with mental health. Understand this. When you're dealing with your mental health issues, if you're having severe enough mental health issues and you're trying to brush them to the side, they are affecting things that you're dealing with in your life, even though you may not necessarily be understanding or realizing that it is. It absolutely does. Um, one of the most concerning diagnoses to me um, has always been major depressive disorder because it's sneaky. You know, um, things are happening during major depressive disorder that we do not realize are happening and affecting the lives around us until it's too late. So some small things, I'm going to tell you how it happens. You're, you're um, starting to ignore calls that you wouldn't necessarily ignore before, meaning you're pushing ignore. And as days are going on, you really, really, really are like, I don't really want to talk to people as much as I used to. And sometimes we'll say, well, I'm just doing me. Or we'll say stuff like, I just want to have my own personal time right now. And so what your body does and what your mind does to combat some of these small depressive symptoms is it'll begin to justify reasons for your actions. And so you don't think you're depressed anymore. You think you just kind of having a space in your life where you want to do you. But really what's happening is day by day by day. You're starting to isolate and get further and further away from people. And there's a difference. You'll know that. Um, another thing depression does is some, some small symptoms. Um, um, staying in bed a little bit longer. When you're waking up, if you got to get up and go to work, you're dragging just a little bit longer. You're a little more tired, more than you have been before. Um, you're not wanting to get out of the bed. Um and you used to be excited to do so, or at least willing to do so. Eating less, not wanting to work out at all, being avoiding. Um, here's one a lot of people are not thinking of, being impulsive. Okay, And um, uh, a, a, a statement um, I always share with my clients when it comes to depression and anxiety, which can get really, really close to looking like depression, is... You're going to have to deal with these symptoms, whether you like it or not, because no matter what you try to do, you can't eat it away. You can't drink it away. You can't sex it away. You can't shop it away. Those are just temporary things you can do to release a little dopamine and make yourself feel better for a couple of minutes. Then you're going to go back to feeling the way you were before. So I've been really adamant about, you know, telling people you got to deal. Because therapy is supposed to be preventative. We're treated um, uh, reactively, but you got to be proactive, you know. So if, if, you, if you know anyone around you who is dealing with these small symptoms, and it can be subtle, but it snowballs, you got to say something to them. You got to say something to them. Just a gentle nudge, you know, like, is everything okay? I see you not coming around the way you used to. I got to call you a couple times this week. What's going on? Those type of things are the way we show people around us encouragement. If you're experiencing these things, the impulsive behaviors and so forth on, um, and all the other things I just mentioned, then that could be a, a wonderful time, of course, to, to really say to yourself, something might not be right. Um, um, a lot of times you may notice it. I want to push you to think about this for a moment. Uh, during the holidays, there is a thing is seasonal depression, but there, but but holidays can also be triggers for unresolved issues that we have chosen not to deal with as well, um, because holidays set an environment of reflectiveness. This is why it happens. So this is just something to think of. Um, and so as I shared with you before, when I received my diagnosis, um, 
and understood, okay, now you're dealing with bipolar too. Okay, no problem. Um, and I won't necessarily, uh, there, there's a difference between bipolar one and bipolar two. We won't go into the, um, the details right now, uh, due to time, but I, but it helped me. So I was on medication for about a year and a half. Um, and what it led me to understand once I was willing to deal and not run from the truth as a therapist, as an individual who makes his life and his living about supporting others, is that, man, you have to make the rest of your life really about dealing with issues and being proactive when you feel something is happening, even with your physical well-being. That's one of the biggest things that I was able to kind of realize from that moment. Now, here's another thing I had to realize, and I know I'm speaking to someone when I say this. Um, over the past year, um, I've been really serious about my self-care and wellness. So I work out often. Um, I'm still working on eating because I'm a foodie and I love to eat, but um, I'm very conscious. So I'm going to eat a cookie, but I'm going to try to eat half of the cookie. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? However, most of the week I'm eating vegetables. I've always been a vegetable person. I love fruit. And so, you know, you got to incorporate it. One of the biggest things that actually saves my life is I do cardio or workout or calisthenics every day. And I realize I'm working out for my life, you know. Um, um, those things combined with a wonderful support system, as uh, John had said earlier, had really helped me kind of grow. Um, I no longer take the medication. Um, and I find myself being more healthy than not most times. But here's the real thing that helps me. Here's the real thing that helps me. The real thing that truly helps me is that I watch those who are around me. Okay. I keep my environment um, at a peaceful level as much as I possibly can. And so when it really, when we really say protect your peace, that is truly what I make my life mission when I wake up every day. Because I realize what I am able to handle and what I am not able to handle. So my encouragement to you is truly sit back, look at your life, do a real inventory, make the time, make the time. Because if you're not healthy, you can't help out, you can't help anyone else. Make the time and really begin to determine what do you need to do in order to become the most healthy uh, you mentally, physically, and spiritually. What is it that you need to do? I'm telling you from a, a, an example of an individual who has grown, from an individual who has seen uh, uh, hurt, pain, loss, disappointment, who has um got put in a position where I was able to kind of pick myself back up with support through my faith, with love, to now to be able to transition to the healthy person you see now. Um, it can be done. It can be done. But I, but I had to do a real self-inventory. And so for those who know me in this phase of my life, most people will agree. Um, I'm very upfront. Um, I'm really honest um, when I can be, sometimes too honest. So friends get mad at me. When I, when I talk too much, um, and I respect that, um, and so I'm learning, you know, I'm learning a brand new, healthier me, which gives me even more conviction to speak to people, especially black people, uh, about the things that we deal with that um, other folk just don't, and how we have to be ever vigilant in breaking these generational curses of not taking care of our health the way that we're supposed to. And so that is truly my encouragement um, to you today. I want to give you some resources, though. I told you I would be about self-care and wellness. Um, get back to something that you really enjoy, okay? If your life is work and home, that's problematic. You got to find some time for yourself. Um, and... I want you once again to do some self inventory to say, what is this, what is something that I can do once a week that brings me enjoyment, this self care? If you need to go to to get a uh, a quick massage, um, and massage envy once a month. Um, is it keeping regular with your pedicures or manicures? Is it getting a haircut? Is it sitting down watching your favorite show for a moment? 
before you got to go in the house with the kids. You got a phone. Stream it from your phone before you go into the house. If that's your five to ten minutes of peace. But whatever you got to do, I want you to take this week, this weekend, and identify what is one thing that brings you joy. And force yourself to stick to it like your life depends on it. Um, that's a portion of wellness. Um, I want you to think about treating your body better. Um, what are you eating? Are you a stress eater? Meaning when you are stressed and depressed, are you eating fast food? Are you eating sweets? Um, how can we find something else more healthy to begin to binge upon when uh, I'm an emotional eater? So I get it. Um, so what, what else can we find healthy to binge upon? For me, um, I, go that, I go downstairs to my gym. It's 11 to 12 o'clock at night. Um, I have to do that, and it makes me feel better. So I want you to think of these things. I want to share with you some, some resources, um, and then I see uh, some of the last questions um, here. So some of the resources that we have, um, they're also offered by the Mental Health Alliance that are really helpful, are um, the Boris Lawrence Henson Foundation. It's by Taraji P. Henson. She has a really strong organization that helps out with uh, mental health advocacy. Therapy for Black Girls. Um, they also have a therapist directory. Um, everything I'm mentioning to you all, by the way, is going to have a resource guide or a therapist directory. So the Boris Lawrence Henson Foundation, Therapy for Black Girls, the Loveland Foundation, um, Therapy for Black Men, um, Dr. Ebony's Therapy Cards, Safe Black Space, um, and InnoPsych, I-N-N-O-P-S-Y-C-H. Those are some of the, the resources um, that you can um, find in order to um, uh, find some uh, therapy, some therapy and therapists and resources that may be helpful for you as you kind of begin your journey. Um, one, uh, we had a question from um, Shireen. She said, how do you help people who seemingly don't want help? You just sometimes being being quiet and supportive is also help. Sometimes people aren't ready. Um, but they absolutely want sometimes being present. That's what I'm looking for. Your presence is encouragement enough and letting people know in gentle nudges that you are kind of paying attention to, um, when things change and when they get ready, they'll let you know. So a lot of times that they're our friends, we want them to get better now, but people have to get ready when they're ready and we have to be okay with accepting that. Um, wonderful question. Um, and I want to read it out loud to everyone. Uh, systematic racism has been noted as a direct cause of mental health issues in the black community. Um, so how do you address that intergenerational trauma and the harm racism caused among those suffering from mental health issues and among the black community as a whole? So we kind of touched on that a little bit um, early and I want to go in depth. I'm happy you asked, asked this question in such a succinct way. Um, that's a systems question, of course. And when I say systems, that goes back to, you know, disparities in healthcare, which are super documented. Disparities in healthcare, um, another big place that they show up is in um, infant mortality rates being sky high, specifically for black women. So that's a systems approach um, for disparities in healthcare. Um, racism, because it's going on so long, is an internalized thing from black people. And so there are certain cues and different issues we deal with in racism that we feel. This is why when we saw police brutality, we saw George Floyd, uh, Trayvon Martin, so forth on, and all the uh, Tatiana Jefferson, all these people who dealt with police brutality. This is why even though you didn't know them, for some reason you felt it. Because it's a psychic bond and it's a, a community pain that we feel from generations of racism. So the way that we kind of combat that is, um, is through advocacy, the way we're doing now, the way organizations, um, we're in, you know, one of the 10th largest metroplexes in the United States. So when public organizations such as, you know, um, uh, uh, Dallas Public Library, City of Dallas, and uh, um, whatever major city you're in, kind of put platforms for people to speak about these issues, this is how I feel like it can kind of chisel at the issues. Um, it's awareness. 
That's how we chisel. Um, we need people who are major influencers to begin to speak more who are not black. Um, every civil rights movement, um, every personal and human rights movement did well because they had allies across the board. And so I feel like because of systematic racism, you need those um, who are affected directly, indirectly, and those who are in a place of privilege to be able to speak up loudly and proudly about it in order that we can bring awareness. And so then ultimately, that's how systems and laws change over time. So I appreciate that question. Um, that was a mouthful, but hopefully uh, everyone understood what we're kind of saying. So um, thank you so much. Um, are there any more questions uh, before um, we go here? I always have so much to share. Um, so I definitely um, am thankful for this this, this hour um, of being able to share these things with you all. Um, but once again, thank you so much. I'm Cleveland Robinson. I can be found at Real Soul Ambassador. I mean, y'all got to follow me and share me with your friends. I'm going to have um, a lot of content coming out this year. And I'm going to um, be doing a lot of in-person things this year as well. It's coming. They'll be starting to ramp up by the end of the spring. Um, one of the biggest projects I want to be working on is pop-up conversations. I did it right before the pandemic. And it's pretty much, um, I'm going to be going to different places. Um, that'll be virtual and in person. And just literally popping up um, and talking about um, mental health just randomly to people. And so it's called Pop-Up Conversations. And it'll be coming to um, a campus virtually or um, in person or a city near you. So look out for that. Pop-Up Conversations. Um, and then I have, of course, um, I'll be bringing it back um, um, some things to my um, official Facebook page at Real Soul Ambassador. You see the blue check, you know it's me. Um, I think there's some other ones out there, but that's the only official one. And um, on my Instagram. And so please check me out on there at Real Soul Ambassador. Um, all my information is on there. That's why I'm shooting it to you. And so even if you are not on social media, um, you can still go to incrhouse.com. You can find me there and send me a message to my inbox. I would love to hear from you. Um, on a personal level, I do see clients still, um, but uh, not a lot because we are we are always packed. But if I if I am not able to help you personally, um, I have a lot of referrals and resources, and I'll make sure that you get the assistance and the help that you need. So once again, thank you to Dallas Public Library. Um, uh, thank you so much um, to Alicia personally. Um, as well as Mr. Isaac um, and the Dallas Public Library. Thank you so much. And thank you for everyone who's joined and shared this post. Uh, thank you, Mr. Robertson, for joining us. It was a very insightful program. Uh, we enjoyed having you. And um, for everyone, the audience, I will be sending you a follow-up email with the resources that Mr. Robertson had mentioned, and I also will include the YouTube video link since this program has been recorded, and you can share that with everybody. Um, and I will be doing that hopefully by the end of the day or tomorrow. Um, and if there are there any more questions before we end the program? Um, if you want to speak, you can unmute your microphone and ask Mr. Robinson directly any questions that you have. If there are no more questions, then we can go ahead and end the program. And again, I will send a follow-up email. And thank you so much, Mr. Robertson. I hope that we can have you more for more programs here at DPL. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Yes. Yeah.